I am 16 years old, and my friends have always been telling me how I should explore the deep web. I always heard bad things about the deep web, so I told my friends that I never wanted to do it. Until that one day. I was bored and out of curiosity, I decided to go on the deep web. I said to myself, it's online, I'll use a VPN, what's the worst that could happen to me? That night, I researched about getting into the deep web, and after following a few steps, for the first time in my life, I was inside the darkest part of the internet. At first, there wasn't anything too bad. But then this one video popped up telling me that it's a special invite for me. So, I clicked on it, and it brought me to a page with a blank black screen. I sat there for some time and it's still a blank screen. So, I decided to exit out, but right before I do, a person appeared on the screen. The person had a mask on. They showed up a sign that said, who should we kill next? The chat box went crazy, and everyone was naming different people's names. Then the video ended. I said to myself, this is so stupid and waste of time, they were just trying to scare people. So, I went to exit out again, and like before, another video came up. I stared at the video and thought to myself, this looks very familiar. As the person holding the camera moved closer to a house, I realized that it was someone I knew. It's someone I used to go to school with. His name was Ben. The person went to the door and knocked on it. I was like there's no way this can be true. Ben only lives with his dad. The door opened. It was Ben's dad. He said, how can I help you so late at night? And the person behind the camera stabbed Ben's dad and walked inside the house. With my face left in complete shock, I quickly grabbed my phone and called Ben. No answer. I called him again and he picked up. I told him that somebody was in his house. He laughed at me and told me he would call me back later because he was busy. But right before ending the call, he heard a noise downstairs. He then started to get a little scared and asked me how I know someone is in his house. I told him, I went on the dark web and the person was recording themselves in your house. I even told him that they killed his dad. Scared to death he went under his bed to hide and call 911 as soon as he can. Ben was unable to make the call as the person with the camera entered into his room and looked around for him. They couldn't find Ben, so they started to walk out of the room. Right before they did, Ben's phone went off. The guy behind the camera looked under the bed to where Ben was hiding and put the camera down. I heard Ben screaming through the phone and then the phone call ended. I tried calling back several times, but no answer. Later that night, police arrived and investigated Ben's house. They found out that Ben and his dad was killed. I felt like I should tell the cops, but I felt kind of responsible for their death, so I decided not to say anything. I told myself to stay off the deep web. It was nighttime and I was getting ready to sleep. But before I went to bed, my computer turned on to that blank black screen. I went over to my computer and tried to shut it off, but it wouldn't turn off. I started to panic and try disconnecting it, but it still stayed on. Then the camera came up. And this time, it was at my house. The camera turned to the man in a mask, and he put his finger over his mouth and said nothing. I ran downstairs to tell my parents and they called the police. The police came and they unfortunately didn't find anything. I promise to never ever go on the deep web again. It's still hard for me to sleep to this day. The person was never caught. Who knows where they might be. Alice was the most beautiful girl I have ever laid eyes on. She was sweet and kind with confidence, that shone brighter than the stars in the night sky. She had the milkiest white skin, her hair was jet black, with emerald green eyes and natural blood red lips. The day she walked into my life, 
I knew we were meant to be together forever. It took me months to work up the courage to say hi to her, and when she said hi back, I was hooked. I did everything to make sure she knew how much I loved her. When she was sick, I would watch over her all night to make sure she was alright. I would spend hours just stroking her hair. She loved it. I made sure she started every week with a smile, with a fresh bouquet of flowers sent to where she worked. She was loved, and she loved me back. But then, things began to change. She started becoming withdrawn. She stopped leaving the house, wouldn't go to work. She wasn't going to tell me what was wrong, so I had to find out for myself. It didn't take me long to find out she was getting unwanted calls from a guy claiming to be madly in love with her. He was bombarding her day and night with phone calls sending her creepy letters saying if he couldn't have her, no one could. It was my job to keep Alice safe and I promised her I would protect her, so I decided to stalk her stalker and it didn't take me long to find out where he lived. He lived in a dingy apartment in a place known as Skid Row. I watched his movements. I watched his obsession grow. It was then I knew I needed to act. I broke into his apartment, knowing he was busy watching Alice. As I looked around his apartment, his obsession was a lot greater than I expected. He had pictures of her all over the place. That night, he came back into his apartment, not knowing I was lurking in the shadows. Watching Alice must be tiring work, I thought to myself, as he passed out on his bed. I crept out from the shadows. I stood over him, as his chest heaved in and out. I picked up a pillow and placed it over his head. By the time he knew what was happening, it was already too late, as he struggled for air, and before I knew it, his body went limp. It didn't take long for Alice to get her life back on track. She was back to her bubbly, happy self again. As I watched over her as she slept, I couldn't help but think, did she know how lucky she was? I stroked her hair as I leaned in to whisper in her ear. Soon, my love, you will finally notice me and realize how much I love you. I saw him on one of my usual walks along the bridge. It was a tall, middle-aged man in a cheap-looking suit. If anyone had asked me how I knew, I wouldn't have been able to answer them. You just look at his face, and you know. I approached him carefully, not wanting to spook him. Sir? He turned around quickly, his face drenched in sweat. Who are you? He replied nervously. I'm Mandy, I answered with a smile. You should move away from there, I said, pointing to the edge of the bridge where he was standing. It's pretty dangerous. He looked at me for a few seconds before speaking again. What are you doing here? He sounded out of breath. Oh, I come here often. I wouldn't say it's my favorite place in the world, but it's quiet and I like that. I smiled at him again. He shuffled his feet and looked down at the water below. You really shouldn't be hanging out in a place like this. Your parents must be worried sick. He sounded calmer but wouldn't meet my eyes. My parents know I'm here. I spoke softly. They know I like to help people like you. He turned to me as a look of honest surprise washed over his face. What? I looked at him unblinkingly. 
I know you want to jump, but you're scared, and you should be. The look on his face changed to one of uneasiness. He tried to say something, but nothing came out. It will hurt like nothing's hurt before, and that's just the fall. The aftermath is even worse. His eyes widened, and he shouted, Get out of here! You don't know what you're talking about! He sounded more alarmed than angered. I continued to look at him as he breathed heavily and pointed to the pictures and flowers attached to the railings just behind him. Actually, I do. He looked in the direction I was pointing, taking a few seconds to process what he was seeing. He then turned around slowly to look at me, pure horror on his face. How are you? At that moment, I knew I had saved him, at least for now. He stood there for a moment longer, frozen, unsure of what to do. Then he did the best thing he could, simply turned around and ran. Fast. I dropped my shoulders and breathed a sigh of relief. I walked over to the railings and just sat there looking at the pictures. We Miss You Mandy was written on a big card, decorated with hearts and flowers, right next to my yearbook photo. Gone too soon, said another, surrounded by teddy bears, clothes, and lots and lots of flowers. It all looked so pretty. My name is Mandy, I was 19 when I died, and now, I try to help people live. This story takes back to when I was 12 years old. I was finishing up school. I called my mom and dad to come and pick me up, but they both had to stay longer for work than expected. So I had to walk home. I usually don't mind walking home, but that day I was not feeling so well. I didn't even want to come to school, but my mom made me. I expected to be walking home a lot more this year due to both my parents starting new jobs since we just moved to a new town. We had this really weird neighbor. He didn't seem he was fully there. He would come over and talk to me about my day and my plans. I found it normal because he was our neighbor, but he only talked to me, not my parents. And he was 34 years old which made this a little weird. My parents are only a couple more years older than him, so why doesn't he just talk to my parents? I honestly didn't think of it too much. But every time he talks to me, he would do it when my parents weren't looking. And when my parents came in sight, he would walk away. I was walking home and in order for me to get to my house, I have to pass my neighbor's house. He had a disgusting and creepy looking house. The house smelled awful when you would go near it. So he would always come to our house. The house looks abandoned and looks like it hasn't been taken care of in years. I was approaching his house. I felt uneased and a little scared. So as I got closer to the house, I FaceTimed my friend. Maybe the man wouldn't bother me if he knew I was talking to someone else. That's what one gut said. My other gut said that there's nothing to worry about. Like mom said, you were going to meet a lot of weird people in life. My friend's parents worked around this area, so they were pretty familiar with it. I showed my friend the house, and then I see the man. Who are you talking to? Just one of my friends. 
The man asked if I can turn off the FaceTime so we can talk. So I ended the FaceTime call with my friend, but right before I ended it, my friend's parents' face were in shock. The man then asked where my parents were. They were working late today and won't be home until a while. The man's face lit up in a long, creepy smile. He then said, I got a dog. Do you want to see it? He knew I loved dogs. I felt a little weird, and I felt pressured in saying yes. But before I did, he started walking me back to his house. I felt very uncomfortable as we were walking. I looked down on my phone and saw my friend's tets. He said, don't go anywhere with that man. The house is owned by a lady. No man. It felt a little strange, but maybe he was family. Just as I was going into the house, my mom yelled my name. Where are you going? I quickly ran back to my mom and told her what happened. She called the cops and the cops investigated the neighbor's house. They found out the smell was coming from the lady who owned the house. She was killed by the man. My mouth dropped when I heard that, and there was never no dog. They never caught the man. I never walked home alone again. I don't know what would have happened to me if it wasn't for my mom and where this man is today. It was every family's nightmare. My wife and I had the day off work, and we had taken our son out for lunch and some family bonding time. But as we approached our home, something felt off. I had a growing sense of dread the closer we got. As our house came into view, I could see that the front door was wide open. Someone had broken into our home. I told my family to wait outside, in case the intruder was still inside. They obliged, and I slowly and silently made my way through our house. As I stepped into the living room, I saw broken furniture, nothing in its correct place, just utter chaos. Was this person looking for something? Did they have malicious intent? Why did they choose our home? Why did they choose us? Next, I walked to our kitchen. The fridge had been emptied. Dishes and food were thrown all over the room. What kind of person had broken into our home? A homeless person who just needed food? If so, why had they destroyed the living room? That's when I heard it. Footsteps in the bedroom. The intruder was still in our house. I took a brief moment to be grateful that I had asked my wife and son to wait outside. It was impossible to decipher this person's motives so far. But I was about to come face to face with the person that forcefully entered our home. And I would demand answers. I crept toward the bedroom slowly. Slowly, I approached the door and focused on the sliver of light slipping through the crack. I could see faint shadows dancing in the light. I raised my hand, placed it against the door, and took a deep breath, readying myself for whatever may be on the other side. I pushed the door open and stepped through the threshold with authority. I couldn't believe my eyes. I actually rubbed my hands over them, thinking I was imagining things. There, in my son's bed, was a young girl with curly blonde hair. She stared at me with white eyes. She must have been terrified. I must have been a few feet taller and at least 100 pounds heavier than her. I must have been a sight to see for that little girl. But she should have considered that before breaking into my home. I called my wife and son to see what I found. Is that a human? Yes. It is. That's dinner.
Bye. And <laughs> send me a text so I know you got home safely. Sure thing, babe. Love ya. Was Maria's drunken response. Stumbling out of Lorna Jenkins' 21st birthday party almost three hours ago. I still haven't heard from her. For some girls, exchanges like this are just virtue signaling. Obligatory chatter they don't intend to actually follow up on. But not for me. When I tell my best friend Maria to let me know that she's made it home, I say it because I care. I mean, on one hand, she might have just sent me a reply that got lost in transmission, but then again, she might also be tied up in the trunk of an Uber, being driven out of the country at this very second. Hun, I know these texts are annoying, but please just humor me, okay? I text her hastily. For peace of mind? Still nothing. Ugh, if only this girl knew how much she was stressing me out. It isn't like you not to respond, Maria. You know what happens on the news. This could be the difference between life and death. More radio silence from her end. My heart is in my mouth at this point. Agitated, I decide that it's time to take drastic action. Babe, you're scaring me, I pleadingly message. I'm going to call the police if you don't respond right now. At long last, I see a hurried text from her appear at the top of my screen. Dude, chill the fuck out. I got home ages ago and passed out. Only just saw your messages. Warm relief floods my body. Reassured, I power off my smartphone and slip it into my pocket. Maria is, without a shadow of a doubt, inside the house. Thank fuck. <laughs> I've been waiting outside it for hours. In one swift move, I lift the jerry can at my feet and upend its contents all over her front door. Very carefully, I flick the lit match against the accelerant-soaked wood and watch, from a distance, as the angry flames overtake her house like a bonfire. Of course, I knew that her Uber probably made it back to the house before me and Maria was probably inside the whole time. But... You only get one shot at burning your boyfriend-stealing bitch of a friend alive in her own bed. I needed to be absolutely certain. For peace of mind. I'm starting to wonder if my Uber will ever come. My battery is dwindling, and I'm standing all alone outside of a club on the edge of town. It is closed for the night, and everyone has gone home. But while I wait, let me tell you what happened. So, this club has gotten a new life in recent years as a sort of revitalized hipster dive. It was once a biker bar, almost closed down after a slew of stabbings, and was reborn under new ownership. You know the kind of place. PBR and Fireball for five bucks a couple of old school arcade games, a string light on a patio, American spirits for sale in a cigarette machine. If you got a dollar for every beard, glasses, and plaid combo you saw, you'd walk out of there with enough money to hit one of the classier joints in town. My friends and I decided to stay until last call. The bar staff were out of there quickly as we exited, and I realized I had left my cigarettes on the back patio. I told my buddies not to wait up, and I jumped the fence, grabbed the pack, and came back out to an empty parking lot. The silence was eerie. I couldn't even hear the sounds of the city. I made my way across the lot towards the car, and fished my keys out of my pocket. As I got closer to the vehicle, I clicked the unlock button on my key fob. The interior dome light slowly turned on. Did I see what I think I just saw? In the back seat? I thought I saw a shadowy figure there, but I was too far away to be sure. I instinctively clicked the lock button. The lights went out. About 20 yards away, I clicked the unlock button again, and the dome light slowly lit up the inside. There was no mistaking it. Someone was sitting back there. 
The silhouette was all wrong though, clearly human of some kind, but like the skull was 50% bigger than average. The head was crooked, the eyes were white and big, like glowing ping pong balls as the thing in my back seat smiled at me and stared. A large nose parted the veil of black, wet hair that cascaded down its face. I instinctively locked the door with the remote and the car went dark. I darted back to the club, looked over my shoulder the entire way, but nothing followed. I was more than a little buzzed and past experiences had led me to mistrust the police so I decided to get home and come back during the day to get my car. Surely this was just all my imagination, right? I received an alert on my phone that my driver would be arriving soon. The driver had long black hair and their face was obscured in their photo. Across the parking lot, my headlights turned on. It's been a few weeks since the accident, and it was time to take the eye patches off. I've had them on for over a week and a half now, and I was so eager to see again. The patches were removed, but things were still blurry. The doctor had already told me that I would have trouble seeing for a little while. I took a taxi home and was able to get myself inside just fine. I decided to take a nap that when I woke up, my eyes would be a little more well adjusted. I fell asleep on the couch and ended up sleeping through the whole night. I woke up the next morning and my sight had vastly improved. I went outside to check my mailbox. I made it out the front door and noticed my neighbor staring at me. I wished him good morning. No response. John just kept staring at me. Weird. I thought to myself before walking to my mailbox. As I was getting my mail, a car drove by and the driver was staring right at me. He followed my gaze to the point that I thought he was going to crash his car. This scared me, and I quickly retreated back into my house. I tried to shake what just happened so I decided to turn on the TV. It switched on as I was in the kitchen getting a cup of coffee. I thought that I had accidentally muted it because there was no noise. I looked over and the news was on, but the anchors were just staring into the camera. As I walked closer to the TV, the anchors followed my gaze. No words, no expressions on their faces. Just lifelessly staring at me. Scared, I grabbed the remote and turned on the Netflix. I turned on a movie to try and get my mind off of this. Again, just silence. I looked back to the screen to see all of the actors just staring at me with the same blank expression on all of their faces. What the hell is going on? I shouted. This was a scripted movie that was filmed years ago. How is this happening? Their gaze followed me all the way around the room until I finally turned the TV off. It's now been two weeks since the patches came off. I'm sitting alone at my computer afraid to look at anything that may include people to look at me. No one has spoken a word since the patches came off. No one has done anything. Except stared at me. I can't do this anymore. The stares are too much. I even tried to put the patches back on, and I can feel them looking at me. Please make it stop. I look down at the fork in my hands. This will be the last thing these eyes see.